Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the CR event today. We appreciate you taking everybody joining us for our discussion. I'm Matt Pietrassi with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CR Consortium with Aid Environment and Profundo. Our focus today will be on JBS, Marfrig, and Minerva, the largest meat processors in Brazil. Our report published late last year assessed the company's exposure to deforestation and analyzed their market reputation technology risks as cattle is the main driver of deforestation in Brazil. In our presentation today, we will discuss why the companies show little progress in monitoring indirect supply chains, why they face material financial risks from European investors, how recent market shifts create various risks for them, and how each business model creates distinct risks among, amongst the three meat packers. A few housekeeping issues before we move forward. Everyone in the audience is on mute, but if you have any questions, you can type your questions into the Q&A function, and we will aim to answer them after our presentation. Our main speakers today will be Bart Slob of Aid Environment and Herard Reich of Profundo. Jack Cunningham of Aid Environment and Barbara Cooper of Profundo will join us for the Q&A. And with that, I'll hand it over to Bart. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Um, yeah, so, so recently uh, we've done a lot of research on the three um, largest meat packers in Brazil, uh, JBS, Mafrig, and Minerva. Uh, they are the largest meat processors in Brazil and they dominate uh, beef processing and exports. JBS is the largest animal protein company and the second largest food company in the world. Um, and we estimate that uh, in the Brazilian beef sector, JBS has a market share of 11.5 to 19 percent. Mafrig is the world's second largest beef company by production capacity, with an estimated market share of 4.5 to 7.5 percent. And Minerva um, is an export oriented beef company that accounts for 17 percent of all beef exports from Brazil. Uh, it holds, this is also an estimate, between 4 and 7% of Brazil, Brazil's beef uh, product production capacity. Now in this table on the left, uh, we've um, drawn up a short profile of the three companies. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to uh, the slaughtering capacity for each company. Here we can clearly observe that JBS um, as a company is a lot larger than Mafrig and Minerva. Also, if we look at the amount of people that work for the three companies, here we see that uh, JBS has a workforce of 54,000 uh, employees, whereas the workforces of Mafrig and Minerva are smaller. Next slide, please. We uh, were able to map parts of the supply chains of the top three uh, meat packers by using data on animal transportation and the uh, rural cadastre data. So in, in uh, Portuguese, this is called the Guias de Transito Animais, uh, Transito Animal, sorry, the GTAs as we call them, and the cadastre data is the Cadastro Ambiental Rural. Uh, and by doing so, we uh, were able to locate over 1,500 direct suppliers and over uh, 3,100 indirect suppliers in the Cerrado and Amazon biomes. And this is only a small sample of the total of suppliers to JBS, Marfrig, and Minerva. Uh, for instance, uh, GBS states that it has over uh, 50,000 direct suppliers. So what we've done is a small thing, it's a snapshot, but we do think there are valuable uh, conclusions to be drawn from this uh, sample. The suppliers that we located uh, operate in the states of Goiás, uh, Minas Gerais, Mato Grosso do Sul, Mato Grosso Pará and Tocantins. The, uh, the, the way we've defined direct suppliers and indirect suppliers is that direct suppliers send one or more batches of cattle directly to a top tree slaughterhouse. Um, and from indirect suppliers, cattle batches move through one or more farms uh, before being sold to one of the top three slaughterhouses. And here in the table, um, you can see a short summary of uh, 
the number of farms we've identified for each meat packer, the direct ones, the indirect ones, the total area that these farms cover, uh, the deforestation that occurred on these farms between 2008 and 2019. We've also calculated the average deforestation per farm, uh, the percentage of hectares cleared, and for the indirect suppliers to each meat packer, uh, we've uh, we've identified the remaining vegetation in hectares on the located farms. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. Uh, by doing so, we were able to uh, draw some maps. So here you see the location of uh, 1,545 direct suppliers to the top, top three meat packers. Uh, the yellow ones are um, with a, um, a cow or boy in the, in the middle is a Muffry slaughterhouse, the yellow one, the blue one is Minerva slaughterhouses and the red one is a JBS slaughterhouse. And we've also plotted the direct suppliers on this map. So if it's red, if it's red dots, then it's JBS direct supplier. If it's a blue one, Minerva direct suppliers and the yellow ones are uh, direct suppliers to Mafriv. Um, here you also see the state boundaries for the, uh, for the sample. Uh, it's important to flag that some states uh, we haven't been able to identify suppliers because the data was um, uh, unreliable or we just couldn't find any data at all. So, for example, you see here that the states of Amazonas and Amapá uh, are not included in this sample. One of the things that we wanted to do is to have a look at whether these suppliers supply only to one of the big meat packers or to two or to three. So in other words, is there an overlap between suppliers? Uh, most of the direct suppliers in the sample trade with only one of the top three meat packers. Uh, of the three, uh, of the direct suppliers in the sample, 81.1% sold to only one of the three meat packers, while 10.9% of the farm supply to two meat packers. So the combinations of Mafrich and Minerva, uh, Mafrich and JBS, or Minerva and JBS. Only 5.1% of the direct suppliers sold livestock to all three meat packers. And the most common overlap is the combination of Minerva and JBS. 5% of the farms that traded with two meat packers sold cattle to both Minerva and JBS. Next one, please. Uh, this is the map for the indirect suppliers. So here you see the location of over 3,000 indirect suppliers to the top three uh, meat packers. Uh, same story here. The um, slaughterhouses, um, the Muffry slaughterhouses are in yellow, Minerva slaughterhouses in blue, and the uh, red ones are the JBS slaughterhouses. Here again, we see quite a dense map of, of mainly JBS indirect suppliers, but also lots of suppliers. Uh, to Minerva, uh, indirect suppliers to Minerva and Mafri. Uh, we, have, we, we have identified that the exposure to deforestation is much higher in indirect supply chains. So absolute and relative deforestation figures reveal that the top trees exposure to deforestation is higher than in, in their indirect supply chains than in their direct supply chains. Uh, 983 direct JBS suppliers deforested 20,296 hectares, whilst 1,874 indirect suppliers to JBS cleared over 50,000 hectares from uh, in 2008 to 2009. So here you can clearly see in this little example for JBS that indirect suppliers tend to deforest more than direct suppliers, and this has something to do, we think, with the lack of monitoring in the indirect supply chain. Land use change represented 0.85% of the cumulative land area of the farms that supply directly to JBS. Uh, for Mafrig, this figure is a lot lower. Uh, it was 0.6%. And for Minerva, it's even lower, 0.44%. Next slide, please. We've also observed that there's more, uh, there has been more land clearing suppliers in the Cerrado than in the Amazon biome. 
So here in this table on the left, uh, we see the deforestation figures at suppliers to Minerva, Mokir, and JBS slaughterhouses uh, from 2008 to 2019 per biome. Uh, in our sample, suppliers in the Cerrado biome are responsible for more land clearing than uh, Amazon-based suppliers. Approximately 71% of the detected land clearing in JVS direct supply chain occurred in the Cerrado biome, in some cases without the required environmental licenses. Uh, the numbers for Minerva and Mafrich are in the same range. 80% uh, of the detected land clearing in Minerva's direct supply chain took place in the Cerrado biome, and in Mafrig uh, direct supply chain, 76% of the total amount of deforestation occurred in the Cerrado. Next slide, please. We uh, see that meat packers have. Um, historically focused on compliance in direct supply, chain, supply chains, but that they've shown little progress on indirect supply chain monitoring. So the TAC audits, uh, the um, thermo, Thermos de Ajus de Conduta, uh, these audits commissioned by the large meat packers report high levels of compliance for direct suppliers, but their connections to indirect suppliers remain largely out of sight. So we see this as a, as a challenge and also a challenge and opportunity really for future uh, improvements. Uh, the top three meat packers are not really uh, monitoring their indirect supply chains yet. Also, um, in addition, research by several organizations connects the meat packers to purchases of laundered cattle originating from areas linked to deforestation, uh, breaches of indigenous rights, uh, or forced labor. Uh, we've had some reactions of the meat packers um, before we published our report. We um, we showed us uh, we showed them our work, and also in their reactions to our, our our research, they stated that they are confident that their cattle purchases do not come from areas that violate their sustainability agreements. But they also admit that they cannot determine the origin of many of these cattle, and this course re refers to the uh, indirect parts of the supply chain uh, that are hard to monitor. Can I have the next slide please? This, um, with this I would like to give the floor to uh, my colleague Gerard who will talk us through the business and financing risks. Yes, thank you uh, uh, Bart. Um, yeah, all these uh, uh, data that you've seen can lead to, sub to material business uh, risks and uh, financing risk is a very important one here and uh, well about JBS we already know that uh, that uh, invest like Nordea and HSBC have made statements on JBS uh, also about divestments uh, and this, this is probably the top of the of the iceberg and um, if you look to that also, also finances grow increasingly wary about uh, Brazil's political and economic climate and yeah that can lead to outflow uh, from the current investors reduced in, uh, interest from new investors um, and um, refusals to uh, uh, extend loans and other activities and in this um, in this aspect it's important for instance to note that in uh, in June 2020, a group of uh, 30 um, investors with 3.7 trillion US dollars assets under management, uh, they signed a public letter and called on the Brazilian government to end environmental uh, destruction. And they, uh, they already signaled to divest from Brazilian assets. So that's quite an, an, an important, important risk. Uh, furthermore, there is market access risk uh, that is related to uh, sourcing risk from, for, for customers as they are not allowed to source anymore from deforested land. But also it's related to, to, to another issue that is that meat from COVID-19 plants cannot be exported anymore. Uh, there is a technology risk uh, in particular, the strong rise in of the plant-based uh, proteins, 
and that is an uh, that is a global phenomenon but it's uh, uh, we i come back later on that uh, and this all can lead to an impact on um, on revenues costs profits liquidity uh, and the valuation uh, of these uh, companies next slide please Yeah, last year we had already the uh, the, the publication of uh, of a report, JBS outsized deforestation in supply chain, um, COVID nineteen um, uh, pose fundamental business risks, and in this report we calculated um, not only the COVID aspect but also the deforestation aspects, and. Um, uh, these risks they could have an uh, an impact on EBITDA, an order cash impact of five to twenty six percent as part of of EBITDA, and that is a uh, number of one point uh, three billion US dollars uh, a year in various scenarios, from low to mid to uh, high impact scenarios. If you could would calculate the DCF value of these impacts. It would mean that they are equal to seven to thirty-eight percent of the equity value of JBS. Well, taking into account that uh, uh, that Marfrig and Minerva um, also uh, could be faced by financing risk, and um, uh, then um, the, the, the could be uh, it, it would be good to have a look at the next page for this. Next slide, please. Uh, Marfrig and Minerva, they are much smaller than JPS. Um, as you can see in market cap, uh, they are less than one tenth of, uh, of JBS both. Uh, and if you look to the enterprise value, also the size is, uh, is much, much smaller. However, these companies are all three highly dependent on debt financing. If you take a look at the um, net debt uh, EBITDA ratio of all three companies, they are uh, well above uh, two. And uh, also net debt is a significant part of the whole enterprise value. Uh, if you look to JBS, it's around 40%. And for Marfrig and Minerva, it's even uh, much larger. It is, uh, it's above 50%. So there is a, re a refinancing risk is an important factor for these uh, for these companies and um, uh, uh, as i already said uh, marfrig and minerva they are more dependent on debt than than jbs next slide please well in the jbs report we already uh, we already concluded that 42 percent of the identified financiers of jbs and that was related to the whole of JBS. That's not only JBS Brazil, that is the listed JBS, which is also, of course, has activities in North America. 42% of the identified finances of JBS uh, have def uh, zero deforestation policy. These include uh, shareholders, these include bondholders, uh, as well as, in, uh, as, well as uh, banks. Um, um, European legislation to reduce deforestation in supply chains is a impo very important uh, development and the financing costs of these companies, uh, of these three companies, uh, they might increase as refinancing of loans and bonds will become more, uh, more difficult. It's not only the companies which are sourcing from, from JBS um, in Europe, but it's also of course the finances of these companies which uh, have to take this new European legislation increasingly into account. And if you then look to the dependence on the European finances, then um, uh, JBS and Marfrig, they, have an, uh, they are dependent for 32%, respectively 30% on European finances, uh, while Minerva is, uh, is dependent for 24%. This, these are identified, uh, this is identified, identified financing. And if you look to the top of the European finances, uh, the, the largest are Barclays, Rabobank, Santander, BNP Paribas, 
they have zero deforestation policies on, on DIF, or they are very vocal on this issue. Um, next slide, please. Um, reputation risk. Uh, also, investors can also be uh, confronted with reputation risk. Usually, this uh, reputation risk is much more for, uh, for, for meat packers than for the fast moving consumer goods uh, companies. That's where fast moving consumer goods, those are most, uh, mostly exposed to, uh, to, to, to reputation risk. Um, any reputation risk currently appears to be already discounted in the low valuation multiples of the Brazilian meat packers. If you take a look, to the enterprise value EBITDA. I think that one is most relevant in this case because sometimes the earnings are, the net earnings are relatively low, but the EBITDA always is a relatively big, big, big size. Then you can see that JBS at 4.8, Marfrich 3.9, and Minerva 5.3. These multiples are substantially lower than an average group in, uh, in this same sector in South America at 7.6, or in North America, where it's 13.1. Uh, um, uh, of course, while valuation multiples might remain low, uh, valuation can still, the value of these stocks can still uh, uh, lower because the, uh, the earnings could be affected by market access and technology risk effects and they could lead to further investment risk and further value uh, loss. Next slide, please. And that's ma mainly, this, this market access risk is mainly related to, uh, well, for instance, still the impacts of COVID-19 because several plants need, needed to be, and need to, uh, need to be closed because of, um, of, 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 of COVID-19. But in particular, it's the sustainable sourcing policies and the technology risk. Uh, they are, uh, and these risks are mainly related to Europe uh, and to, to, to China. If you, take, uh, if you take a look to the exposure of these companies, uh, and that's, that's for the whole companies, of course, that's not only for the Brazilian activities, that's for the listed entities, uh, then you can see that uh, net turnover uh, through exports for JBS is 27%, Marfrig is 16%, and Minerva is even 76%. And then to Europe, the, those numbers are relatively small 1.4%, 1.8, 4.6. But to China, where there is really a an, an, an risk related to, to COVID, but also the technology risk, uh, because also there a move to uh, increasing uh, attention for plant-based uh, proteins is going on. Uh, the exposure to China is, is, uh, is relatively high. It's 9.1% for JBS. Marfrig, it's 10.4%. And Minerva is very highly exposed to, uh, to China. So um, negative effects from China and, uh, and, and European exports, they will hurt uh, EBITDA if this occurs, this, uh, this, this, this impact. Uh, it might also lead again to an increase what, when EBITDA is declining, it might also lead, it will lead to an increase in the net debt EBITDA ratio. And this might put again further pressure again on debt refinancing. Uh, so with this, I'd like to hand back to Matt. Yes, uh, thanks Gerard and thanks uh, Bart for those great presentations. Now we will move to the Q&A part of the, um, of the of the presentation. So the, the first question we have is about the 2009 cattle agreements. Uh, the question is, uh, do the 2009 cattle agreements with Greenpeace cover no deforestation of def direct suppliers only or indirect suppliers as well? And do the annual audiences that are done cover direct suppliers only or do they evaluate progress in indirect suppliers as well? I believe um, Barbara can um, will answer that question. Yes, um, so as uh, regards the G4 agreements that uh, were close with uh, Greenpeace at the time, um, 
they did include uh, um, a criteria to implement tracking systems for indirect supplies by 2011, which uh, none of the sign trees um, actually achieved. Um, so yes, the, the plan was to, to have that included, but um, it didn't happen. The, the progress is only starting slowly now. Um, the other part of the question, sorry, now I forgot what that was. <laughs> Oh, the auditors, yes. Um, so the audit reports that um, are available so far are focusing on the direct supply chain. Leaving out a, yeah, a large part of the actual complete supply chain of uh, the cattle. Okay, great. Thanks, Barbara. Um, the next question also deals with uh, indirect suppliers. Um, what are the expectations for these companies in regards to um, indirect suppliers? What is best practice and are there any strategies that have worked for any of the three companies? Yeah, um, so you can Bart. Uh, what, we've, what we've seen in our research is that we could safely say that at the moment among the three companies, uh, JBS is the largest footprint and also relatively high numbers of deforestation in comparison with uh, Mafrich and Minerva. Uh, what we also see is that there are continuous new commitments. Huh? So, so Mafrich has just uh, published a new commitment, uh, their Verde Plus um, strategy, I think it's called, to end deforestation by uh, 2030. Now, we must also um, remind ourselves of the fact that since 2009 really and even before uh, the meat packers have made renewed um, uh, commitments to end deforestation uh, and the last commitment was to end it by 2020 and not only meat packers but also uh, the uh, retail industry um, and there are also financial institutions uh, there are also companies that source for example soy so so we see that there are a lot of uh, traders as well, uh, companies committing uh, to, def to ending deforestation. At the same time, we know that these commitments are usually not met. Um, and I think it would be interesting to also have a look at what consumers might expect and what investors might expect. And um, maybe the technology is not quite there yet, but I think the um, the objective would be to achieve full traceability here so that we know exactly where cattle is coming from and uh, brazil has has quite advanced systems for the, for it that's also what we've observed with the uh the trans to animal there there is good data available uh, but the data is usually for sanitary uh, uh purposes so they're not they're not geared to registering data uh, around sustainability and deforestation but they're there because we need to know about the animal's health and we need to know about um, uh, food safety um, so maybe uh, by improving those systems working together with uh, the brazilian uh, government those systems can also start uh, being used for uh, purposes of measuring um, uh, yeah, cattle that might come from legally or de illegally deforested areas. Uh, right now, we're not there yet. We also find that uh, it's not that easy to get uh, this data. The data is not available to everyone, so you would have to run s s very specific uh, uh, programs. You would have to develop very specific IT programs to get that data uh, of the websites they're, um, they're based at right now. So I think that system could be developed, but yeah, in the end, of course, it is the responsibility of the meat packer to be as transparent and, and, and to offer a traceability that is as, as in-depth as possible. Great, thanks, Bart. Uh, the next question is a financial one for uh, Herard. How much of the meat packer's 30% financial dependence on European financiers is linked to banks and how much to institutional investors? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, well, it differs per, per, per company, but a major part of the European uh, investments and, and, for, and financing is through loans uh, to, uh, to these companies, and in particular to JBS. 
uh, a big part of this of this exposure comes from from Barclays, Rabobank, uh, Credit Suisse, and Santander giving loans to 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 to, to JBS, and um, and also on top of this, there is a lot of uh, underwriting services by uh, by by investment banks or by the investment banks parts of these um, uh, banks that I mentioned. Also here again, Barclays, Rabobank, and Santander, they, are, they give underwriting services for the issuance of bonds and of, of, of shares. So they don't own these shares or bonds, but they uh, help them to, uh, to place them on the, on, the, on the global market. So um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a combination. And for the smaller ones, for the smaller companies, Marfrig and Minerva, uh, Europeans are giving a lot of these uh, uh, these underwriting services in shares and um, and bonds. That's that's the main activity activity that can be identified because uh, not every loan can be identified. Um, um, it are um, let's say loans from syndicates that can be very well identified, but not always the individual loans between one bank and one company. Great, thanks, Gerard. Uh, the next question um, is for uh, Jack Cunningham um, from Environment Will Answer. What sources were used to calculate deforestation in hectares? And is this calculation based on property boundaries of farms or just deforestation in the area? Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, to answer the question, um, the sources that we used was the protest alerts that come from INPE, which is the Brazilian uh, space agency. That's an arm of the kind of Brazilian government. I think it's the Ministry of uh, Science that it's part of. And basically they produce uh, confirmed deforestation alerts every single year that you can download and are publicly available. So we downloaded those alerts and we overlaid them with the rural cadastral information. So yeah, it was the actual boundaries of the farms that we overlaid these deforestation alerts with. We then took that, uh, the overlap and we calculated the hectares um, of how much deforestation overlapped the farm boundaries. But um, it's, it's important to note that uh, sometimes these deforestation alerts or the, the deforestation events can actually, um, they can be transboundary, so it can cross over a boundary. So actually, this method can actually be seen as being a bit conservative in its estimate. Okay, great, thanks a lot for that, Jack. Um, the next question is about China and I'll direct this to Barbara. Are there any signs that China will be requiring no deforestation criteria when imports from Brazil anytime in the near future? Well, there, there were signs um, during the last couple of years that uh, also from uh, the Chinese um, uh, buying side, um, these questions are getting more attention. Um, the thing is that after that statement that was first issued, I think in 2018, um, that this would become a priority, um, I don't think uh, terribly much has happened. Uh, at the moment, obviously, discussions are much more focusing around COVID and, uh, and food safety issues, but um, uh, I, I think that this development will will begin. You, yeah, we see that on many different topics that uh, the the awareness and the discussions about sustainability also in China are picking up quite a bit. So, yeah, and as a as a very crucial market for the Brazilian beef industry uh, and also other livestock products that have a considerable impact. Great, thank you. And so the next question is, um, why uh, do, you, do we think that the industry cannot converge around a, a techno technological solution for secondary sourcing of cattle? Yeah, good, good question. <laughs> well, it certainly, it certainly involves costs. Um, but yeah, well, the, well, if you think about the, the, the ideal situation, then uh, you would have uh, digital tracking, so uh, like an ear tagging system, uh, yeah. which uh, would uh, solve part of that problem, um, which so far is not, uh, um, yeah, I don't think it's even being discussed really. Uh, there are parts of the Brazilian supply chain that, that are being tracked much more under the EU requirements, the, the CISPOF, that is, and that's again for animal health reasons, but that's only a relatively small share that um, 
fulfills those criteria. But um, yeah, obviously full traceability, that would be, uh, that would be the, the, the best scenario to, to be able to, um, to exclude um, controversial suppliers. Great, thanks, Barbara. <laughs> I saw a question coming up about um, um, EasyPack, um, which is a, a tool that has been developed by a group of researchers and organizations that is freely available to, to the meat companies in Brazil as a way of improving traceability and, uh, and their monitoring of the supply chain. It's not perfect, but it can certainly help to, to solve uh, part of the issue. Um, the, there are some trials now from some of the actors in the in the sector, but it's not being broadly picked up yet, which yeah would be an interesting option also in the short term because what we see is that this deadline gets pushed and pushed and pushed, and uh, there are tools available that can improve the situation and are not yeah fully yeah. used to their possibility yeah, what I find interesting is is that Minerva as opposed to JBS and Mafri, they, they have not announced announced new objectives to monitor indirect suppliers. So JBS says 2025, uh, Mafri says 2030. But then Minerva said in a letter to us, they said differently from its peers, our peers, sorry, we are not postponing actions to tackle deforestation from our supply chain from direct and indirect suppliers. We are acting now with the best available tool. And then they mentioned that VisiPack tool. Uh, to, to check indirect suppliers. Uh, so this al also might be a new development that knowing how difficult this is and how many times it's been postponed, uh, companies are now saying we're not setting new objectives, but we're just working with the best available technology possible uh, to start mapping these indirect suppliers. I, I do hope there's a sense of urgency there because uh, this is long overdue, as has been said before. Yeah, what uh, what uh, what what uh, Giro said here, what uh, Barbara said about costs, that is of course a very important point. And we have uh, chain reaction research also has published reports on the cost of monitoring, verifying uh, this kind of policies. And uh, we did it for in the casino report related to the uh, Brazilian beef uh, uh, chain, and it would have meant that casino casino Brazil would have had to increase price by 3% to pay for a good uh, monitoring and verification of its often uh, often beef supply chain without deforestation 3% great thanks Gerard. the next question is if all the data shows that there're growing risk for financial institutions and for these three companies um, why are they still growing? Is it because they're tapping into uh, a number of markets that don't have environmental and other sustainability standards? Yeah, maybe maybe Barbara can 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 add something when. Uh, but but it's it's clear that these companies continue to grow strongly in China um, and also in other markets where of course where the. Um, well, the, the, the sustainability policies are much, much lower than, than, than in Europe, but, uh, but maybe can, Barbara can add something on this. So that, that's quite some leakage, what's happening, finding new markets where regulations are l less strong. Uh, but maybe yeah. Barbara has more here. Yeah. Well, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, like if you look at uh, um, sustainability criteria, usually the EU has, uh, um, yeah, it, EU countries often have the highest uh, requirements there, but then the EU is not a big market for Brazilian beef. Most of it goes to indeed China, to Middle East, to some relatively, yeah, there's new markets that are being opened up also in, in other Asian um, regions. And um, yeah, the, overall the, the requirements uh, lower than, yeah. Sorry, Barbara, we couldn't hear the last bit. Okay. Oh, I'm really sorry. Yeah, my connection is a bit patchy. Um, so there are, China is the most important market, but there's also some other Middle Eastern countries. And um, 
new newly developing markets for Brazilian beef uh, in in Asia that uh, consume the largest share of um, of Brazil's exports. Um, and then, yeah, it shouldn't be forgotten that uh, almost 80% of the beef is consumed in Brazil. So this is not only about exports, it's also about the domestic market. Great, uh, thanks a lot, Barbara, for those points. Um, the next one is about the, um, the, grow the risks uh, between municipalities and within by within biomes, are there any differences between the tiers of indirect suppliers? So how do the risks vary in um, between municipalities? Um, I don't really know the answer to that. What I do know is that there's a, a, a very big difference between in, in data between different places huh? and then mainly the states. I don't know about the municipalities. Jack, could you maybe shine a light on that? Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm not too sure about the municipalities, but I know that the levels of um, the levels of the indirect supply would get more and more, um, unless the company themselves are monitoring it, it would get more and more difficult to follow um, exactly which cattle went to which other indirect supplier before going to the basically every step of the indirect supply you go further back it gets harder and harder to follow the cattle because indirect suppliers have so many other indirect suppliers um so yeah it's it's, it's difficult to see with the data that's available at the moment Great. Uh, thanks, Jack. Um, one, qu uh, another question for Barbara. Are the Brazilian cattle fed with animal feed such as soy or are they grazed? And if they do use soy, are we missing something here by not looking at companies' soy deforestation footprints? Yeah, good question. Uh, but uh, soy is not really playing a big role in the, in the cattle um, fattening in Brazil. In the last stages, there, yeah, there is some uh, compound feed involved, but if you look at the Brazilian soy consumption, then the, the vast majority of that goes into pork and poultry production. Great, thanks. Um, I would like to um, direct this one to Jack. Uh, what is the source of data of farms selling to each meat packer, and are they publicly available? Sorry, the, what are the sources of data selling to each meat packer? Right, of uh, connecting the farms to the meat packers. Ah, okay. So it's the it's the GTA that uh, Bart talked about, um, which is basically like uh, animal transport data, um, and then it, it has uh, it has or it has like um, the kind of origin destination and and information around it, and it also has the um, the final destination. Um, which is usually the meat packer. So we're able to sort through these and locate the ones that go to JBS, Minerva and Marfrig, and then we can allocate them to the specific company. And then we use that to uh, geo-reference them in QGIS. Great, thanks. Um, so we have a number of questions about uh, recent initiatives that these companies have announced. Um, so uh, JBS recently announced this new uh, Together for the Amazon initiative to collect data from indirect cow supplies in the region. Um, what are our thoughts on the strengths and weaknesses of the company's strategy? Yeah, oh, so, I can... uh, sorry, Barry. No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we also wrote about this in the report. Huh? So we wrote that, uh, yeah, they will use a blockchain a technology and GTAs for monitoring and the company will block suppliers that do not cooperate and comply. But they will first roll this out in Mato Grosso. Um, but yeah, the issue, I guess it's, it's, it seems to be too late. Huh? So, so that's, you know, you have such a commitment gives JBS an additional five years to continue to purchase cattle linked to deforestation and to uh, human rights abuses while allowing the company to, to placate its investors and at times at the time when JBS risks are becoming a major global divestment target. So yeah, I think that the general 
idea there is among at least civil society organizations and other uh, yeah, uh, critics uh, is, is that th this is not urgent enough. Would you like to add to that, uh, Barbara? Yeah, in addition to that, uh, which is obviously a very crucial point, considering that the discussions have been going on for, yeah, by then it will be more than 15 years. And uh, the other important point is that uh, this commitment only looks at the Amazon and doesn't include the Cerrado, which is very worrying as well, because a lot of deforestation is also happening there and in other high risk um, biomes, obviously. Um, yeah, there's also... Uh, deforestation taking place in other very biodiverse uh, biomes in Brazil and South America. Okay, uh, great. So uh, the next question is on the um, political situation in Brazil. Um, in the past few years, we've seen an increasing loss of transparency and information available. Um, in uh, so, and what is the government's role in this reduction and what should be done to ensure that agribusiness production chains are, um, are, are transparent and don't come under attack? Yeah, I feel, I feel a bit, um, I don't feel I'm the right person to answer this question. Uh, I don't live in Brazil, even though in the past I lived, I did live in Brazil. I'm not a Brazilian national, so I don't really know what people are going through at the moment. And what companies are facing in terms of uh, of deregulation, I do know from from relatively yeah, independent sources that uh, there is yeah that there, there's this constant attempt to uh, uh, to undermine existing environmental uh, regulation, and, and this is a worry to me as a person. As I speak personally now, uh, and I think uh, what what investors could do is to, and they have done that before, which is really commendable. Uh, to contact the Brazilian government. Um, I, I understand they had a good meeting with the vice president uh, some months ago uh, to, to address this concern that, um, that there should not be deregulation, but there should be an, uh, a concerted uh, attempt to improve uh, um, conditions related to the environment, to counter deforestation, to counter climate change. Um, so yeah, I think uh, the, the Brazilian government has a, a key role to play, and I hope they uh, they will play it well. Great, thanks, Bart. Uh, the next question is in regards to legal and illegal deforestation. Um, the Brazilian Forest Code allows for a set aside in Sahado, and how does this complicate what the um, what the companies are are doing and their commitments? Is this something you want to talk to about, Barbara? Maybe I'm I'm not quite sure. I understand the question. I'm yeah. sorry. It's true that yeah, depending on where in Brazil operations are, there's uh, different shares that need to be set aside, which are a lot higher in in the Amazon, where around uh, eighty percent have to be kept as uh, forest. Um, and um, in the Cerrado, that's uh, a lot less. Um, so the the amount of deforestation that can take place in the Cerrado that um, is legal is very high in comparison to the Amazon, for example. It's a, around 80%, which um, yeah, indeed makes uh, the discussion a bit more complicated. On the other hand, um, if we're talking about zero deforestation commitment, then that would mean no deforestation, yeah. so no illegal and no legal deforestation. And, um, yeah, so that uh, is a difficult discussion that is also taking place a lot in the soy uh, sector because of the argument that um, farmers are then prevented from uh, developing the land that they have. But uh, there are also um, initiatives now to, to tackle that, hopefully, in the future. But uh, um, yeah, the, the discussion around legal and illegal deforestation that uh, remains difficult. But yeah, if we're talking about zero deforestation, then there should not be more conversion of natural forests. And there is a lot of already developed land that can be used. So there, there's millions of hectares that have already been deforested in the past. 
Hey, uh, great, thanks, Barbara. Um, have there been attempts to build legal cases to target the meat processing companies in order to require them to tackle their indirect supply chains? I'm not aware of that, but certainly that uh, risk will increase with uh, yeah. more countries looking at uh, laws that uh, either, yeah. yeah, due diligence laws uh, like the one in France. There's other countries who, who are discussing these types of laws and also to, to put much more obligations on companies to monitor the supply chain. So the hope is that this is uh, going to yeah, that the regulations in consumer countries is going to be strengthened and that could indeed mean that, um, yeah, there may be uh, law uh, lawsuits coming. Yeah, there's one uh, recent case. It's not uh, a case uh, against a meatpacker, but uh, against a client of meatpackers. Uh, and it's a company called uh, Casino, better known in Brazil as GPA. Group of and they. Um, uh, this is a case that's currently developing in France uh, under the France uh, due diligence legislation, devoir uh, de diligence, I think it's called in French. Um, basically, ba based uh, build around this argument that indirect suppliers are not uh, monitored and that there are irregularities, and that uh, casinos should do a better job in monitoring these. Uh, irregularities. So here we could expect a sort of trickle down effect because casino, uh, because of this case, uh, might look at their suppliers to, um, to, to ensure uh, that um, meat isn't coming from recently deforested areas. Uh, and then these suppliers, which are the meat packers, will then have to implement systems to ensure that uh, casino can say, well, this is meat not coming from deforested areas. So I think yeah, there, there's currently such a push going on, not only from consumers, but also from a certain uh, civil society organizations in collaboration with uh, uh, boutique legal firms that are trying to, uh, to clarify this area of law, which is uh, these new due diligence uh, type of legislation in, uh, in consumer countries. Great, thanks Bart. Uh, we're coming up on the hour, so we'll have time for about uh, two more questions. Um, the next one uh, for Barbara, uh, we wrote about the three main meat packers in this report, but what about the rest of the market? Um, has there been any, um, what type of sustainability gains have we seen there? Yeah, that's a very good question and a very important one. Um, yeah, there's obviously a lot more uh, meat packers in Brazil, a lot more. Uh, well, the ones we're talking about now are the, the three top ones, and they do account for a considerable part of the market share, but there are a lot more slaughterhouses that stay under under the radar. <laughs> and yes, that, that is a concern, absolutely, because, uh, well, yeah, if you talk about leakage markets, then yeah, this is certainly something that is happening there as well, that uh, there's a lot less monitoring and, um, and, and yeah, uh, really um, uh, attention to to other slaughterhouses. Um, well, we focus on the, the big ones because yeah, there, there's a large market share, but certainly it makes a lot of sense to also think about how to deal with uh, the rest of the market, which yeah, it, many, it always comes down again to that legislation is needed to, to really cover uh, yeah, the market uh, better in, in improving the standards. Great, thanks, Barbara. And the last question is um, about issue we touched on a bit earlier, the EU due diligence laws. Um, might they be applied to investors as well as uh, corporations? And if so, how would this affect um, EU imports? Ooh, that's a difficult one. Uh, yes, <laughs> ideally, these kinds of legislation should certainly also apply to financial institutions. That's also, yeah, what is being called for when we look at supply yeah. chain law. Um, but how, how that would uh, affect them, that's maybe more a question for here, right? <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's, not, that, of, of, that's, that's not, so, not so easy to answer. Yes, they will have to, uh, financial institutions will have to focus, of course, on their investments in companies which have an uh, 
uh, due diligence on deforestation, which is bad. So they have to engage with these companies. So that's what financial institutions will uh, will need to do. Um, and um, yeah, as a consequence, of course, they, these, these asset managers, banks, they have a reputation risk here. They face a reputation risk if they are invested in or are, are, if they are financing this kind of companies. There is a problem and um, probably it can, of course, work out also uh, if, if, if it's becoming legal. It's also going to work out uh, financially negative on these, uh, on these banks. So, uh, yes, it will be... A, and uh, not not a trickle down, but here a trickle up. So also the uh, the the the, uh, the banks and the asset managers will need to take much more care of that. And uh, that's not only pressure from from legislation from the European Commission, but also the European Central Bank is also increasingly looking at uh, factors which which are related to not only to climate risk but also to deforestation and the risk for the uh, uh, the risk for the financial institutions. Uh, so it's uh, it's really become it's not only this is not only about uh, about physical companies which have a due diligence to in their supply chain. Now this is becoming much broader. So also the financial institutions will get uh, increasingly be affected by this regulation. Great. Thanks a lot, Gerard. And thanks a lot for everybody for all of your great questions today. Unfortunately, we didn't get to all of them, but if you would like to ask us any follow-up questions, um, if you have any comments, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, our emails are on the slide right there. Um, and thanks everybody again for tuning in and we'll talk to everybody soon.